On May 30, 1912, Bishop Milton Wright wrote in his diary of the sad event that had just occurred in this room. This morning, at 3.15, Wilbur passed away, aged 45 years, one month, 14 days. A short life full of consequences. An unfailing intellect, imperturbable temper, great self-reliance, and as great modesty, seeing the right clearly, pursuing it steadily, he lived and died. In this modest home, exactly 13 years earlier, Wilbur's life had changed. In 1899, he composed a letter to the Smithsonian Institution testifying his faith in the future of flight and embarked on a journey whose results were indeed full of consequences for himself, for his family, and for the world. With his younger brother Orville, the one-time bicycle maker, sometime printer, and quiet young bachelor realized the great unfulfilled dream of humankind, to fly. Everything changed because Wilbur Wright became curious about the problem of human flight. In the process, he became a visionary scientist, engineer, pilot, and competitive entrepreneur. Yet he remained a devoted son, a trusted brother, and a beloved uncle. To his family, he was Ullum. It was one of several nicknames the family kept for each other. Orville was Bubbo. Their sister Catherine was Sturchins. Nieces and nephews had nicknames like Inez, Buster, and It. All were doted on by their uncle. The children recalled Christmases with Uncle Will and Orv, playing with the toys until they were broken, then repairing them until they were better than when they were bought. Orville made them candy. Wilbur read them stories. When he amazed the world with his first public flights in France in 1908, he met kings, queens, tycoons, and renowned figures of all kinds. One was children's author Gillette Burgess, whose goop books had been favorites in the right home. Wilbur told him it was a pleasure to meet the author of the books he'd read more than any other. Burgess was stunned. Like any family, there were difficult times as well. When Wilbur and his siblings were growing up, their father Milton, a bishop in the United Brethren Church, was constantly traveling. As tuberculosis took hold of his wife Susan, it was Wilbur, then 22 years old, who cared for her in her husband's absence. She was only 58 when she died. Bishop Wright was forever grateful to his son. He devoted himself to taking all care of her and watching and serving her with the faithfulness and tenderness that cannot but shed happiness on him in life and comfort him in his last moments. Such devotion in a son has rarely been equaled. In turn, Catherine Wright, the youngest of the Wright children, cared for her brothers. Sometimes they needed it. In 1901, when Wilbur was invited to give a lecture to the Western Society of Engineers in Chicago, he had nothing suitable to wear. We had a picnic getting Will off to Chicago. Orv offered all his clothes. So off went Ulam raid in Orv's shirt, collars, cuffs, cufflinks, and overcoat. We discovered, though, that to some extent clothes do make the man, for you never saw Will look so swell. Their modest home on the west side of Dayton was the incubator for it all. It was their place of study, of argument, of practical jokes, and family dinners. It was where the airplane was born. Will spins the sewing machine around by the hour, while Orv squats around, marking the places to sew. There's no place in the house to live, but I'll be lonesome enough by next week and wish I could have some of the racket around. Wilbur initiated a correspondence with the eminent civil engineer, Octave Chanute, in May 1900. Chanute was the leading authority on flight. Among many other sources, Wilbur had read his Progress in Flying Machines, the most thorough survey of aeronautical science at the time. Dear Sir, For some years I have been afflicted with the belief that flight is possible to man. 
My disease has increased in severity, and I feel that it will soon cost me an increased amount of money, if not my life. In letter after letter to the older engineer, as well as other writings, Wilbur plumbed the depths of the flying problem. In a wind blowing 20 miles per hour, the drift of the machine, when loaded to bring its weight up to 50 pounds, was 8 pounds. But the total drift resistance of a large machine at its soaring speed will be less than that of a smaller machine at its speed since the resistance of the operator's body will be less made about 17 glides. Found the machine less manageable than expected. The rudder too large. The center of pressure apparently about 30 inches back Found lift of the machine edge. much less than Lilienthal tables would indicate, reaching only about one-third as much. Found that machine at 100 pounds would not glide at 3 degrees or 4 degrees. Now, if the pressure had been normal to the cord of the surface, the drift proper would have been to the lift 108 pounds, as the sine of 13 degrees is to the cosine of 13 degrees, or 0.22 times 108 divided by 0.97. We have tested some very remarkable surfaces. For instance, our number 25 reaches its maximum lift at about 7 degrees, and then remains constant within a range of less than 2% at the angles of 10 degrees, 12 degrees, 15 degrees, the main thing though degrees. is the new machine. It is 32 feet by 5 feet, spreading an area of 305 square feet altogether. The curvature is about 1 in 25. We had it out making some tests of its efficiency today and are very much pleased with the results of our measurements. In two days, we made about 250 glides. We increased our record for distance to 622 feet, for time to 26 seconds, and for angle to 5 degrees for a glide of 156 feet. The letters reveal Wilbur's scientific and engineering brilliance, breaking the problem into component parts and solving each one in turn. In a very short time, he and Orville would eclipse Chanute and all others in solving the fundamental principles of flight. On October 5, 1905, Wilbur turned in the longest flights of the Wright brothers' experimental period, flying over 38,000 meters, more than 24 miles, around Huffman Prairie, near Dayton. It was a stunning demonstration of fully practical flight. Ever the engineer, Wilbur simply recorded the data in a pocket-sized diary. Wind north, six miles per hour. Second trial, Wilbur Wright, 38,956 meters. 39 minutes, 23 and 4 fifth seconds. 17.05 meters per second. About 30 rounds of field. While the Wrights are duly recognized for inventing the airplane, Wilbur and Orville also flew their airplanes themselves. They were masters. Wilbur was the first of the brothers to fly, making all the flights in their 1900 and 1901 gliders. Wilbur was his own flight instructor. His approach was as simple as it was courageous. There are two ways of learning how to ride a fractious horse. One is to get on him and learn by actual practice how each motion and trick may be best met. The other is to sit on a fence and watch the beast a while, and then retire to the house and at leisure figure out the best way of overcoming his jumps and kicks. The latter system is the safest, but the former, on the whole, turns out the larger proportion of good riders. It is very much the same in learning to ride a flying machine. If you are looking for perfect safety, you will do well to sit on a fence and watch the birds. But if you really wish to learn, you must mount a machine and become acquainted with its tricks by actual trial. Wilbur was the first of the brothers to fly in public. His flights in Le Mans, France, were the first demonstration of not only a fully practical aircraft, but also of a product. The Wright brothers launched the airplane when they had customers and contracts in hand. No one thought they had it all together. The newspapers and the French aviators nearly went wild with excitement. Blériot and Delagrange were so excited they could scarcely speak, and Capfer could only gasp and could not talk at all. You would have almost died of laughter if you could have seen them. Wilbur thrilled American audiences with stunning flights from Governor's Island in New York Harbor, past the Statue of Liberty, to Grant's tomb and back. He carried a canoe just in case he needed to land in the water. Wilbur was also an instructor, 
having taught pilots in France and Italy, and the first American military pilots at College Park, Maryland. Wilbur's skill as a pilot was matched only by his brothers. He set records almost every time he flew. The Wright flyers were unstable and required strength and finesse to fly. An Italian cameraman put his life in Wilbur's hands as he captured this footage. Wilbur made it look so easy. But to Orville, he was simply Will. Although Wilbur initiated their investigation of flight, they quickly formed a formidable engineering team. They would only separate when tending to business. More than anything, they were brothers, and famously argued as only brothers could. They could be brutal with each other, but it was how they solved problems. I am absolutely in the dark. The last letter I have from you is that of June 11th. But in it you say nothing at all about being at work boxing up things, and do not say that you intended to begin soon. It is exasperating. I have had only one letter a week from you, these very short, in the last month or more. I have practically no information of what is going on. When you cable, you never explain anything so that I can answer with any certainty that we are talking about the same thing. I opened the boxes yesterday and have been puzzled ever since to know how you could have wasted two whole days packing them. I am sure that with a scoop shovel I could have put things in within two or three minutes and made fully as good a job of it. I never saw such evidences of idiocy in my life. We found this morning that the trouble with the engine was in the feed pipe between the bend and the nozzle. I think when you bent it to make it more central in the pipe, you squeezed something between the sides of the tube at the bend. I kept telling you at Kitty Hawk that the gasoline was not feeding right. I do not see how you can put on four and three-eight cylinders, as the part that goes into the hole in the bodies is only one-eighth thick now. Beneath all the shouting, there was the deepest respect and care. They created powered flight together. They needed each other every step of the way. Be awfully careful in beginning practice, and go slowly. Theirs was a partnership of peers, complementing each other in skill, intellect, temperament, and imagination. Their failures and their triumphs were shared. We were greatly rejoiced last evening to learn that you had succeeded in your first flight in making a complete circle. The newspapers for several days have been full of the stories of your dandy flights. And whereas a week ago I was a marvel of skill, now they do not hesitate to tell me that I am nothing but a dub, and that you are the only genuine champion skyscraper. Such is fame. The brothers were filmed together only once at Fort Myer, Virginia in 1909. Orville had crashed there the year before, with his passenger Tom Selfridge becoming the first fatality in an airplane accident. Wilbur assisted Orville in their return, supporting his every need. Only one moment of interaction between them was filmed. The camera captured Wilbur in the moments before Orville's last trial flight, giving his brother the thumbs up. It has been a gesture shared by pilots ever since. Seven months after Wilbur died, his father reflected on his life. In memory and intellect, there was none like him. He systematized everything. He could write or say anything he wanted to. He was not very talkative. His temper could hardly be stirred. Wilbur left a profound legacy. His power of imagination, creativity, perseverance, pursuit of knowledge, courage, intuition, and logic solved the problem of flight. It is one of the singular greatest achievements of humankind. If we can fly, what is it we cannot do? <laughs>